They keep trying to turn me into Simon Shul. I was trying to get my Project Pirates going. Um, my relations in Hollywood were mainly with Paramount. I did two pictures with them, Rosemary's Baby, Chinatown. I had very good relationship with them. So I was hoping for that everything somehow collapsed and I needed to work. And I knew they had a book called The Tenant. So uh, I went to Barry Diller. I said, Barry, how about me? going to Paris and doing this book right away. He didn't know what it was even. You know, they have books they ignore sometimes for, 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 for decades, you see. I think they actually had it for something like 10 years and nobody was doing anything with it. And uh, I don't even know whether uh, Barry read it after my asking him uh, to, you know, to, to do the film from it. But he trusted me and he says, yeah, absolutely, what's the budget? I said, approximately, I can't remember what it was, but it was relatively low. And it was a handshake. I went to Paris and made a movie. Good afternoon, madame. Uh, yes, what is it? I'm sorry to bother you. I was told about an apartment. Well, I heard about the book I read and it made me laugh because it's, it's funny, you know? I'm afraid if my film is not funny to everybody, but I always treat it as a, a comedy. The previous tenant threw herself out of the window. <laughs> I knew Topor, you know. These were the times where we would meet in the, one of the Central Men, the press ca cafe where this type of people, this type, I mean, like me, like him, like, you know, my age and people interested in movies, literature, etc would meet uh, virtually every day, you see, mm -hmm. just to talk about, uh, not only about films, a lot about the girls, you see, a lot about politics. And uh, I told right away um, Topper that I'm going to write the script from his book because the book is with Paramount. He had no rights for the book. They were, you know, when the studio buys a project, they buy it entirely. They don't want to have anything, you know, to do with the author in <laughs> thereafter. So went back to Paris. Uh, prior to that, I lived in Paris for many years. And uh, I was born in Paris, in fact, before my parents took me back to Poland, before the war. Uh, so. <laughs> So that it would be good to, to, to make a film here. I did only a short film years before that. Uh, so I never made a real movie in France. That was my premiere. Filkovsky, is that a Russian name? Polish, Polish. So you're not French? I'm a French citizen. That side uh, I knew the best at that time, at the time of, of the tenant, because as I said, I was born here. I was only three uh, just before the war uh, when my parents went back to Poland. My mother died in Auschwitz. My sister was a few years older than me. She was a, still a bit of a teenager, went to the same camp but survived and decided not to come back to Poland anymore. She found herself in Paris. She got married here. And uh, after a few years after war, today, at that time, it seemed to me ages, but now when I look back at it, it was only, I don't know, five, six years, which is nothing. And eventually when the Polish communist authorities started giving people possibility to reunite with some of the family. I got a passport to go to meet my sister. And I went to my first, that was my first 
a trip to Paris. And that was France very much like the one you see in, in the tenant. They're always looked on with suspicion, especially if they're not French. But I'm a French citizen. I was around 20. I was at the film school already. So that gave me the first contacts also here with certain uh, people who are interested in films. But then later I came back again, stay with my sister, where I was already quite advanced in the school and thinking of preparing my first feature film. You know. After that, I lived in uh, Paris for about three or four years, trying to get work, and that didn't happen. I went to England. I had already on account one feature film, The Knife in the Water you see, which won at the Venice Film Festival, funny enough, the <laughs> Critics' Prize, which I just won again a few weeks ago. And uh, I was somehow hopeful of uh, putting it together here. I started working with Gerard Brush then, and we wrote my first two films, Repulsion and Cul de Sac. But going back to France, I lived those three, four mega years when with Gerard Brache, we were trying to have films made. And it didn't work. So th that was the inspiration of The Tenant. Certain idiosyncrasies of uh, uh, French, you know, uh, Pari Parisians, I should say, to be honest, you know. Um, uh, their pretentiousness, you know, um, uh, their dislike of anything which is not Parisian, you know. So I say it once and for all, stop whatever it is you're doing at night. People try to avoid it rather in their movies. I, I thought I wanted to show it as it is. We sat to write the script and at the same time we started pre-production because the book existed so certain elements could be put together already on that stage when, I, when we were writing. And we were wanting the film to be done swiftly and maybe to go to Cannes Film Festival, which will be a real stunt because uh, there, there was less than a year to have it completed. It's perfectly natural. I uh, thought, yes, that's something I can do, it's my, my style, and furthermore, I can do acting in it. I know just what you have to. You can't go murderous! Right away, I thought, you know, it's something they can play very well. I told Barry Diller that I want to play this part, and he was very much for it, you know. I was freshly after Chinatown, you know, and everybody liked my <laughs> performance of Kelly, of two minutes, you know, so I didn't have, there were no discussions on that subject. I think I'm pregnant. I've done it already in Vampire Killers, you know. I've done it also in my short films. I said uh, that this was my first film in French here, but in fact, I did the short movie many years before, except there were no, there was no dialogue in it, but I did this fat and lean, uh, you know, so I did shoot a little bit in France. Come on, you don't want to look cheap in front of your girlfriend. Not a word of thanks, did you notice? I don't like tramps. You shouldn't have given him anything. She was big in France, big and, and, and working a lot and maybe having less hang-ups and then she got later, which somehow, I, I must say, slowed down her career. Uh, but then she was well known in the theater. She had on her account already as a very young actress, serious performances. And so, yes, she was important. Have you got a girlfriend? <laughs> Not exactly. Just that I've been repainting in the places and 
Yes. I had already certain popularity in, in, in France thanks to my previous movies. And since there was my first uh, shoot in Paris, uh, the actors were very uh, willing to work with me. And uh, many of those young people who are around me in the film, a group, they were at that time Café Théâtre uh, fashionable. And they were sort of cabarets, you know, for uh, of, often political, uh, very, in any case, uh, there were groups who were fantastic in their humor and acting. And uh, most of those people that you see in the film come from one of those groups, and these were the uh, very first steps on the film set. <laughs> or we can knock on the floor below after midnight, of course. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> knock on a door shutting. On your feet, shit face. We're off to the park for a blowjob. <laughs> you could find some of those people still around in Paris. Many of them became quite uh, important in, in, in the movie business. You know, directors, actors that gain popularity and fame. I'll play my records when I want and as loud as I want. Having the actors of various languages trying to sound more or less uniform is always quite difficult. And that's a problem. This can be very disturbing in the movie when uh, you, you have dialogues between people who are supposed to uh, be uh, persons of the same uh, language of the same country and the accents are all over the place. You only have yourself to blame. Uh, Barry Diller wanted me absol absolutely to use some American actors to give this film possibility of some uh, possible uh, American market. And of course I wanted this, but since the film was shot in English, uh, it was great and easier to use American actors than to use the French ones, you know. So that's how I did it. I divided all youngsters around me should be French, and all those monsters on, uh, on, on, the, on the other side of the uh, age, like Mr. C and others, wanted them to be Americans. I can see what we're dealing with here. Everyone for himself and never mind anyone else. Hmm? <laughs> Why exactly I choose this type of scene? I don't know. I wanted something uh, that would fit the situation when uh, Trelkowski is taking the girl to see a movie, you know? These were the times when this type of movies were only beginning the popularity. Enter the Dragon or something like that was the period, you see? I liked Bruce very much. He was a good guy, you know, and uh, well, I'm sad that he uh, lived f such a short life, you know. But prior to that, my wife Sharon was uh, working with him. I became acquainted. I trained with him and I, uh, we were friends. I trained him trying to teach him skiing, which didn't work, you know. Strangely enough, I realized then that people who you know, who have sportsmen and well-trained in, in a different discipline, have hard time to uh, learn skiing. It's easier to teach skiing someone who is not so uh, such sportsman, you know. <laughs> we wanted to do this swiftly and quickly, so when I was writing the script with Gérard Brache, Pierre Guffroy, the production designer, was working on the sets. We decided to do it in the Epinay studio, which was former cinema. You know, there was a, there was a, a period where Kino Panorama was the future. Uh, these were uh, rooms built in, in this side for three screens, you know, on which the same film was shown, and there were edge breakers which made those three different pictures big one, you know. So it was one of those rooms, you know, mm -hmm. made. Therefore, had a very peculiar uh, 
s form. I am holding this arm open. You are wondering what what's with him, but that's what I'm trying to explain. So the stage has this form, you know. Yeah. It was converted into a studio, into a film stage. But building a set on something of this shape is not easy. And what you see actually in the film was very much inspired of that shape, you know. So we try to, to have a, an, a, a courtyard and the building around this courtyard as close uh, to the Parisian style of that area, you know, in which the film happens. But we were somehow confronted with this very awkward uh, form of the former Sino Panorama, you see? But that's how uh, Pierre Guffroy built with it and managed to get something very interesting because I really wanted to have all of this together, uh, except for the exterior, which we shot on the real street of Paris. But the entrance with the concierge on the right-hand side, with the, all this uh, glass gallery on it, the opposite side of the car, all was done in that peculiar uh, shape of Kino Panorama, the set of, uh, the, uh, of Terkolsky apartment, the stairs, not the real stairs, but the beginning and the end of the set. So it really was one complete set. Somehow uh, trying to fill up that weird shape of the studio. I was shown a new invention which was called Luma, it still is Luma, a kind of crane that uh, allows you to have a camera at the end of the crane and being uh, operated from the post down, quite far from the place where the camera is actually operating. And I, I got really very interested in it. This was a bunch of young people who invented it and needed some kind of promotion. And I was very happy to, to use it. Now they're very famous. What you see at uh, football uh, matches and uh, other events of this sort, the big mast which goes all over with the camera on it, it's, it started on, on the tenant. So there was, I think, one, one of the first, or maybe the very first film that uh, Sven did outside uh, of Sweden, practically. Uh, he was Bergman's uh, director of photography, and I think he did almost all his films. He worked on his own, he was operated and lighting. And I told him that he should try to get an operator and he will have much more freedom. Because anyway, I like to decide what the framing is. And to have it done by the camera uh, is sort of following my instructions to a certain degree. That gives the director of photography much more freedom with his lighting because simply he has more time to do it on the set. And I was uh, trying to convince Sven, who was an extremely lovable character, really. Uh, working with him was a true pleasure. And he said, uh, I'll try it. And since then, all his films were made with, uh, with an independent uh, camera operator. You know, I needed some effects that in, in those times were done on the set because all special effects were real special effects and made physically while shooting. I asked. Pierre Guifroy, the production designer, with whom subsequently I made several movies. I think he was tremendously talented. Among them I did 
test for which, by the way, he got an Oscar. Uh, but that was our first work together. And so I uh, asked him various things that were somehow unusual at, at that time in, in France anyway, and to get the effect of this proper effect illustrating the, the sequence when, I, when, when Tarkovsky is sick, I build a, a room with a reverse perspective. I think it's called Ames Room, if I'm not uh, mistaken, because it it's, has been done by scientists who deal with optics. And so uh, that means that when I was going into depth from the camera, I was becoming the smaller in proportion to the rest of the set. I was somehow disappointed with the effect, in fact, and didn't do much of it, but I kept at least, I think, one shot of it. He wrote the music, and he was uh, with us a lot because he was intrigued by uh, my doing a film in, in Paris, you know. We knew each other from his brother, whom I knew through another producer for whom he worked, and I gave him his first job on this film as an um, associate producer or, or executive producer, don't remember very well, but it was uh, Philippe's brother, and uh, since his brother was working on a film, Philippe hung around a lot, you know, and wrote very good music, I think, to that film. Since there was a lot of glass involved because of the ending, you know, it's jumping through the glass roof, he used this Austrian guy who plays on, gla on, on glasses. I don't know what you call this type of music. But we have certain parts of it in, in the film. We went to Cannes and they destroyed us in Cannes to the point that Gerard Brache, who was very involved with the film from the beginning, uh, we wrote the script uh, very quickly and we were all very enthusiastic. So was the crew. I remember the shoot as a very happy period, you know. Everybody was involved, everybody was up. And somehow, unfortunately, uh, the Minister of Culture, French Minister of Culture, uh, whom I met before, he was very kind, and um, I liked him because he, had, he was a nice guy and had a sense of humor. Uh, he asked me to show him the film we were before Cannes and still um, working on the movie. It wasn't finished, and I have no uh, habit of showing things which are not completed. Uh, but uh, I, I find myself in a difficult position in refusing him for the reason that he was the minister and that I knew him and liked him. So I said, okay, there was no music yet. No, actually, uh, Philippe was still working on the music. We were all in a big rush to be in time for the 10th of May. The uh, minister brought his friend. I was very much surprised but I didn't have uh, guts to, to refuse, particularly uh, because the friend was a writer and a critic. And uh, he wrote an article about film right away that was uh, um, not well received by the rest of the press that we gave somebody an exclusivity unexpected before the film was even uh, completed. And we met uh, um, 
a real storm from all sides of, of the press who were putting down the film even without seeing it. And when we came to Cannes, uh, the film was not even noticed. And those who wrote about it turned it down again. Gerard Braz, who put a lot into that work, got literally sick. And somehow, uh, since then, he was not getting out of his place anymore. You know? And most of the stuff he wrote afterwards, until he died, he wrote from his, <laughs> from his apartment. It's ironic, but yeah, but it, it happened after that. It's almost comical, you know. Don't drive me to suicide. The film uh, was uh, well released by Paramount uh, because they had the, the necessary machinery here to, to, to in new how. Uh, so it had good publicity, but not good reviews. And it was a total flop. No one does it to you like Roman Polanski. But as I remember, a good movie. So that at the beginning, you know, I found it sort of strange. But now I got used to it, and I know that it became uh, some kind of, uh, it has some kind of second life.